Good morning. <clears throat> it's good for me to be here. I um, over the last 12 years, I've dedicated most of my life traveling all across this country sharing my story. And over the last 12 years as a public speaker, I've been very blessed to walk into rooms and present in front of groups like you, the Patriots, the Packers, the Bears, the Cowboys, the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Royals, Harvard, West Point, Yale, TED Talks, prisons, and college commencements. But over the last 12 years, I've had a responsibility of walking into gyms like this and presenting in front of almost two million children. And I truly believe in my heart that it's made a difference for some. I do this for many reasons. One, just like some of you, I wanted to skip this talk. Just like some of you, I tried to find an exit so I didn't have to waste my time and sit through this talk. And just like some of you, I tried to convince my mother the night before that I didn't need this talk. I do this because when it comes to drugs and alcohol, I think we've gone horribly wrong with the way we present it to our children. I think we put way too much focus on the worst day and we forget the first day. We show you pictures of drug addicts, remind you of family members. On how difficult drug addiction is in is for them in the end, rather than sitting you down now, looking you in the eye and asking you honestly, why in the world are you letting this begin? I do this because 10 years ago, I walked into a gym very similar to this. 10 years ago, I walked into a gym packed with no masks, 3,000 3, students, which made me nervous. So I went back in the hallway and I said a quick prayer. Please God, just one kid. If I can help one out of 3,000, this is all worth it. So I walked in, took the mic, and I told it. After I told it, we did some Q&A. After Q&A, I saw no more hands, so I was comfortable with ending the presentation. As I'm exiting, this little girl in the front row tapped me on the leg and said, hold up, Mr. Aaron. And she pointed way up to the top. At the top of the bleachers was, was a little girl sitting all by herself with her hand up, so I started walking across the gym floor to go hear her. As I'm walking towards her, there were a group of kids in her high school that started laughing at her, making fun of her, and telling her to put her hand down, looking at me, cut her off, don't bother with her, she's crazy. So that little girl, who had more courage and guts than I ever had, to raise a hand and ask a question in front of 3,000 kids, I don't know about you, but I didn't like raising my hand in a classroom, never mind in front of my whole high school. She dropped her hand, turned red, and said, forget it, Mr. Heron, because as you can tell, it's not even worth it, Mr. Heron. So I ended it. But I felt like I failed her, and I waited for her to come down the bleachers, but with 3,000 kids, I lost her. And I walked out of that high school wondering and I thank God that little girl had the courage to take that wonder away from me two months later. Dear Mr. Heron, you probably don't remember me because nobody remembers me. But just in case you do, I didn't have a question that day. For some reason, it was the first time in my life that I wanted to tell somebody my story. What I was gonna tell you, Mr. Heron, my father's an alcoholic just like yours. And my father's drinking has gone horribly wrong for our family too. And my father's drinking caused him to lose his job four years ago. My mom has always been a stay-at-home mom, not because we can afford it, my mom stays at home because she suffers from severe depression. But now my mom has to stay at home looking after my drunk, alcoholic father who's mean to her.
And for the last four years with my parents not working, Mr. Heron, I've had to wear the same school clothes every day. And what you wear to my high school matters, and I can tell you, I'm the furthest thing from being a pretty girl. And every day for the last four years, Mr. Heron, I've walked into that high school and heard kids say that I'm ugly, laugh at the clothes, take pictures of me. And for the last four years, I've gone home from high school by myself with no friends. And for the last four years, my father's drunk on the couch. My mom is upstairs in her bedroom with the door closed, suffering from sadness. So I go to my bedroom, I lock my door, I put my music on, I take my homework out, and I do the one thing I know I shouldn't. I go under my mattress, I grab a couple of my razor blades, and I cut myself. I'm a cutter, Mr. Heron, I have been since middle school. Unfortunately, I'm scarred from my wrist to my biceps. I can no longer cut on my arms, I now cut down on my legs. But I wanted you to know that you walked into my high school that day and you said you wanted to help one kid. I had no idea I was gonna be that kid. Because right after your assembly, I went into the lunchroom and I sat at the table where the kids sit who make fun of me the ones who call me ugly. As soon as they saw me sitting at their table, they started laughing at me, telling me to get up. For the first time in my life, I stood my ground. And as soon as that whole table sat down, I rolled up my sleeves and I showed them all my scars. I said, it's not my fault my father turned into an alcoholic. My whole life, I'd prayed that my dad would quit drinking one day. It's not my fault my mom suffers from severe depression. I'm exhausted from trying to make my mom happy. And it's not my fault my parents can't afford to buy me nice clothes like your parents do. I hope laughing at me and making fun of me since middle school has helped you because it's really hurt me. She said, since that day, Mr. Heron, those kids, they've stopped making fun of me. Some have said sorry and others have offered to help me. So I wanna thank you, Mr. Heron, from the bottom of my heart for coming to my high school. I promise you I'll be that one kid. That little girl's been emailing me for 10 years. That little girl's story has impacted, influenced, and affected me more than I ever could have imagined. That little girl who sat in the top, whose face turned red, who has scars all over her arms, She's the reason why I continue to do this. See, I remember, I remember like it was yesterday going out on Fridays and Saturday nights. I remember just like you going to my best friend's house who parents let us drink. I remember the woods when we had no home to drink in the woods we partied in. But what I remember most about high school was the end of the night when it was time to go home to my mom and dad. See, the end of the night, I didn't feel so tough. I wasn't pretending to be so cool. See, curfew was close, so the visine would come out, the gum would go in. I'd wash my hands, spray my clothes. I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, I did everything to cover up my mistakes. 
See, I covered up my mistakes because my mom, my mom truly believed that her little McDonald's All-American basketball player, my mom truly believed that her little boy who played in front of 4,000 people on Friday nights could go out and didn't have to change himself. See, they wrote a book about me in high school. An author, he walked into my high school gym when I was 16 years old and said, I want to follow you for one high school basketball season. That author followed me and 14 of my high school basketball teammates, my best friends, our parents, doctors, lawyers, nurses, teachers, politicians, stay-at-home mommies. Out of the 15 kids, on my high school basketball team that they wrote the book about when we were 16 years old. Out of the 16, 15 kids that drank out of red solo cups and played beer pong in basements. Out of the 15 kids who would have walked in too cool for this assembly, sat at the top and laughed at it, walked out and made fun of it. Out of those 15 kids, seven of us became heroin addicts. but our mommies and daddies are doctors and lawyers, nurses, teachers, politicians, and stay-at-home moms. All we do is drink in the woods and smoke blunts in back seats. We'll never be that guy. I never heard one of my childhood best friends say on a Friday night doing a keg stand or pounding beers in a basement, I can't wait to lose my family. I can't wait to overdose. I can't wait to break my mom's heart. See, I don't know about you, but my dad, I don't know how many of you have family who struggle, but my dad, my dad's an alcoholic. My dad is currently drinking himself to death. But when I was a little boy, I remember like it was yesterday, seeing my father with Miller lights in his hand, hoping he wouldn't open another one. I remember the fights at night, the yelling and the screaming between my mom and dad about his drinking. I remember crying myself to sleep as a child, praying my father would quit the drinking so my family could stay together. And I remember promising, I remember my, promising my mother that I would never pick up a Miller Light. I don't know about you, but I broke that promise when I was 13 years old. See, on a Friday after school, I was walking home, and I told my best friend, don't come into my house, wait behind my garage. I ran into my house, I grabbed two Miller Lights, I shoved them in my pockets, I ran around the garage, and I pulled them out of my pockets. My best friend looked surprised. What my best friend didn't know, I've been waiting a long time to see what my father liked so much about this. I need to know why my father drinks so much of it and won't quit it. So at 13 years old, curious, me and my best friend opened it, we drank it, as soon as I tasted it, I hated it. I dumped the rest of the beer out, I crushed the can, I dug a little hole behind my garage, and we buried him. As soon as we buried him, I ran around my garage to play basketball in my driveway. And as soon as I started playing, my mom, who I didn't know was home, she opened the back slider, walked out onto the deck, pointed down at me and said, Christopher, come inside and come talk to me. 
13 years old, as soon as my mom said, come inside and come talk to me, I ran down my driveway like I was gonna go through my front door. Instead, I went right, ran to the end of my street where there was woods. 13 years old, I hid in those woods for hours that day. There was no way I was gonna let my poor mom smell my father's booze on her baby boy's breath. Do you know how many nights my mother has to fall asleep to that stink? Do you know how many mornings I woke up for school and saw him laying in bed smelling of that stink? I promise you, Mom. When I got sober, my son Christopher was nine. My daughter Samantha was seven. And I had a little baby, an infant. And kids often say to me, now that your children are older, my son will be 22. My daughter is 19. Kids will always raise their hand and say to me, Mr. Heron, now that you're 13 years sober, how hard, how hard was it to see your little girl drunk or high for the first time? Was it difficult for you to see your son under the influence walking into the house for the first time? For now, by the grace of God, I haven't witnessed it. My son, 22, daughter, 19, have stayed away from it. But if they do, if my 12-year-old in high school, middle school, comes into my house smelling of alcohol or marijuana, I'm gonna walk into his bedroom, hug him, remind him of how much I love him, look him in the eye, and I'm gonna ask him one question, man. Can you please tell me why? Why does my little girl need drugs in her life now? Why does my little girl have to change herself? Why can't my son just be himself? With all the suffering we have in our family, with all the struggle that you've seen, why in the world would you take a chance and let this begin for you? We all have our why. Parents don't ask you when they catch you because they're afraid of the answer. And most of us want to pretend it's not there. But let's be honest. There's kids in here right now that have broke the promise. There's kids in here right now that your mom and dad have no clue who you really are? And there's kids in this gym right now and watching on the live stream that are sitting in a classroom that are struggling. See, you're not the kid you were two years ago. Those broken promises turned and your friend is sitting in this gym with you. And your friend is thinking about you because on Fridays and Saturday nights when they go out with you, they high five, hug, chest bump, 
they laugh like it's no big deal. But if they had the courage to be honest with you, they would pull you to the side, look you dead in the eye, and simply say to you, I feel bad for you. I don't know why you have to get like this. I feel bad for your mom and dad. I feel bad for your family because they don't even know you. Both of you are in this gym. See, what your friend won't tell you is that on Fridays and Saturday nights, they feel uncomfortable around you. And let's be honest, there's kids in this gym, in this school, that used to be friends. Like there's kids in the school right now, four years ago, you used to be best friends. But you no longer talk to that kid. You don't have much to say to that kid. You don't see that kid on weekends. Let's be honest, you don't want anything to do with that kid because that old best friend of yours, they don't want to do the stuff you're doing. They don't have to change themselves on Friday nights to have fun. See, I remember, I remember going out and looking across the room and seeing my friends in high school that never drank and smoked, kids who I grew up with who oftentimes I would leave behind because they wouldn't. But what I remember most about those kids who I went to high school with who never would, At the end of the night, I would look across the room and I would see those kids and I would say to myself, they have something, they have something special. Like there's something inside of them that's powerful. Why do I have to change myself? Why do I have to lie to my family? Why do I have to pretend? There's kids in this gym right now who are pretending. See, my goal doing this my goal is that there's one kid in this gym right now that there's one kid in the classroom after this assembly is gonna grab a teacher, a coach, someone in this school who they can count on, trust, look them in the eye and simply say to them, I'm not the kid that I pretend to be. I'm not the kid who walks these hallways. I'm struggling. And I want to feel better. I do this 200 times a year. And for the last 45 minutes before I walked in here, I paced and prayed that that one kid is in this school today. Because I promise you, it will change your family. See, I don't know how many of you 
have a little brother or sister at home. I don't know how many of you have a little cousin in this community. But if you have someone younger in your life that love you, I want you to think of them because that little kid, they adore you. They feel most confident and protected when they're next to you. They'll drop everything if you invite them to be next to you. See your little brother, your little sister, they watch what you wear, they listen to your conversations, they'll follow your social media if they're old enough. When they get to high school, their plan is to be just like you. So as seniors, sit in this gym right now and ask yourself one question. Do you really want your little sister to do what you're doing on Fridays? You really want your little brother to be afraid to walk into that party without it? To have to change himself to feel part of it? It's an honor for me to do this. And it's a responsibility that I would never, ever take lightly. I can just say to you, I wish, I wish I walked out the gym. I wish I grabbed a couple of my buddies and said, let's be better, man. I don't feel good about this. I want to feel better than this. Today is an opportunity to change. Today is an unbelievable opportunity to help a friend. One of the most common questions that I get, it's been 13 years since you shot heroin. Do you ever want to get high? Only when I don't want to be me. Only when I want to run away, shut the noise off. Not being me started when I was in middle school. Running away, shutting the noise off as a teenager. We have 15 minutes. And being that this is your assembly and seniors in the gym, I want to open it up for a couple of questions. But I will say this. I've spoke in front of Tom Brady, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, Ben Roethlisberger. I've spoke in front of Derek Jeter, Big Poppy, Dwayne Wade, Kevin Durant, Anthony Davis, Steph Curry. And every single superstar that I've ever presented in front of had two things in common. They all sat in the front row. And every single one of them raised their hand and asked a question. They don't want to hide at the top. They don't want to blend in in the middle. They want to be right up front. And they don't care what people think about them. So then the they're not afraid to raise their hand. Before we begin to wrap this up, 
Are there any teachers or students that have any questions? So, you did, you've done these talks for, you said, 12 years, right? Mm -hmm. So my, my, the Heron Project has been around for about 10 years. Right. Uh, so my question is, what was it like doing the first one of these talks? How, how, did, how did it lead up to what made you decide you want to do it, and how was the experience? The experience is very similar to the experience today. Like I'm nervous, anxious, I'm clenching this microphone. As much as I do this, it's not comfortable for me. Because, see, you don't have the same vantage point that I have. See, like, I watch kids wipe their tears quick. I watch kids in this gym right now pretending not to cry. The tears aren't behind their mask. You have to understand something. I've been doing this for a long time. And I can't tell you how many students that I've spoke in front of over the last 12 years that have passed away. One of the saddest things that I see, I, I have, I own a wellness center in Massachusetts and Virginia where people who struggle with mental health or substance use, where they live. And I cannot tell you how many times I talk to a mom or dad, listen to them cry, convince their child to come to live at my center. And two days later, I look out the office and here they come. Father in front dragging luggage. Mom, I'm around her daughter in the back. And as soon as they walk into my office and sit down, the first thing they say, Thank you. Second, she heard you speak in high school. I cannot tell you how many kids, now young adults, live in my center that sat in bleachers just like you. And fast forward five years and I sit with them and they hug me and they say with tears coming down their face, I wish I walked out of that gym and told someone. This talk isn't easy for me, and it's not easy for some of you. Like, there's kids in here right now who are keeping their family secret like I did. There's kids in here right now that your mom and dad are unhealthy your house isn't the same anymore because, see, you're the little one in the house. Your big brother, your big sister, they're like me now. They chase death for that feeling. Your big brother, your big sister, now it's not about drinking in the woods or in a basement with red Solo cups. They take chances at dying now with the drugs they do. And your mom and dad are different. See, your mom and dad, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. So they're sad like them. Your big brother, your big sister sat in the same bleaches. They drank in the same woods. They got fake IDs and they went into the same liquor stores. What makes you different? And that's what I said in the beginning. There's so much focus on the worst day and we forget the first day. Too many people talk about the end rather than why it's beginning. And if you're really honest with yourself in this gym today, I don't care what anybody says. There's, there's seniors in this gym right now, today, that are different. Alcohol and drugs, 
are starting to change them. The people they hang with, the grades they get, the sports they play, the things they're involved with aren't the same anymore. Your relationship with your mom and dad, not even close anymore. Your grandparents, you really contact them anymore. And your little brother and sister, you stay away from them. You hardly have any time for them anymore. Any other questions? Uh, after rehabilitation, yeah. how's your, uh, how's your family reintroduce you back into their lives? So I went, to, I went to rehab. I went to treatment for 11 months. You know, four overdoses, sticking a needle in my arm for eight years. It required long term. So after 11 months, I finally moved back with my family. But that commitment of 11 months has given me the last 12 plus years. See, the greatest accomplishment of my life, like if you walk into my high school gym, you know, I have 1,000 point banners, 2,000 point banners, McDonald's All-American posters. The greatest accomplishment of my life is that for the last 12 and a half years, I've been the same father. Like it feels really good to be the same dad to my children. It feels really good to look them in the eye and tell them that their dad hasn't changed himself for 12 and a half years. For the last 12 and a half years, I've been the dad I wish I had growing up. I do this a lot, and I don't even like the word, but in the recovery community, I'm pretty well known in the recovery community. My father, my father lives. You have to understand something, and, and some of you will, some of you won't. But 13 years ago, me and my wife were on food stamps. 13 years ago, my house didn't have electricity, and in the winter, often no heat. Three years ago, I bought my first wellness center. My father lives 10 minutes from it. My father has never seen it. My father's never driven past it. He's never come to it. He's never said congratulations or I'm proud of you for it. 13 years ago on food stamps. And now I have one of the greatest accomplishments in my life and my father, I could, he could walk to it. And he's never seen it. Anybody else? So, you know, that's the beauty of living life one day at a time in sobriety. You find the silver lining in your saddest stories and your worst moments. So all the people who have helped me along the way, I'm still very, very close to, grateful for, and connected with. Um, I have a 24-year-old. I have a 24-year-old in my center right now. That 24-year-old, 
His mom is an ICU nurse. Father, very good job. That mom reached out to me nine years ago to help her oldest child, which I did. After I helped her oldest child, he overdosed and died six months later. One year after his death, the mom, the intensive care unit nurse, called me and said, it's now my middle child. I need you to help me, Chris. I can't lose another child. So I pick up the phone, I call him, and I help him. One year later, he dies of an overdose. Six weeks ago, I get a phone call from the nurse. She said, my Kevin, my youngest is struggling. I need you to help him. I'm going to end up burying all three of my children. Kevin's sitting in a bed right now in my center. I don't know how many of you have seen Saving Private Ryan, but it's kind of similar. Two children, gone, one left. I promise you when they were in middle school and high school, that's not how they seen it. Anybody else? Yes. What do I like more? I like this way more. Um, I would never go back to basketball. First of all, I'm too old now. But even when I first started this and people would inquire saying like, do you want to get back into basketball now that you're sober? I made a decision not to. I love this. I don't, it's kind of bizarre, right? Because this is very hard for me to do. As much as I do it, it's still hard. And when it's not hard, I'll quit doing it. But it's as hard as it is to do, it's something that I unbelievably am motivated and passionate about. Because to me, and I don't think people say this enough, this is not just about drugs and alcohol. Like this talk, is about self-esteem. This talk is about what you see and what you say to yourself when you look at yourself in the mirror. This talk is about confidence and insecurities. This talk is about the people who love you, not just you. It's about the little kids in your life that look up to you. This talk is not just about heroin and alcohol. It's way bigger than that. It's way deeper than that. Anybody else? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, so the question is, is what, what, if we have a family members who struggle, what can we do to help family members who struggle? You know, to me, it's very, very sad. Like, there's a lot of schools in this country that never have someone come in to have a discussion. But there's also a lot of schools in this country that have that one speaker a year, and that's all they talk about with the discussion. And I think it's really sad 
that wellness is not a core class in our school system. Because if we had these type of conversations early, we would be comfortable to talk about it when we get older. And what's amazing, I, pre-COVID, if I walked into this gym, this gym would be packed. And I don't know if they would have brought the middle school in, but I can tell you this, every high school gym in this country that I walk into that have middle school and high school kids mixed together, all the questions come from the middle school kids. They're not worried about what their friends think about them yet. They're not super concerned about their social status. So they, they raise their hand. They're not afraid to talk about it or ask it. Personally, with as much as my father struggles, I've sent him to treatment centers. I've put him in multiple detoxes. But what I've learned over the years, that our relationship is too toxic, that it's really hard for me to help my dad. It's really hard for my dad to listen to me about help. So I bring in other people now. Like I have to bring in someone who's not as close to my dad or connected with my dad to have that conversation with my dad. Anybody else? Yes. My, dad's, my dad has always been around. Um, the question was, was my dad around early in my basketball career? My dad was always around. But see, here's the thing, right? My center, people who suffer from alcoholism, that's the majority of people that come through my centers, alcoholism. But the majority of people that come in looking for help for their alcoholism is between the age of 30 and 55. Alcohol takes time, man. It's methodical. It drags you slowly. It makes you miss things and not be part of it. And what it does, alcoholism makes you wake up at 40, 50, 60 years old and want to do it over again because you go to bed at night and you think of everything you've missed. All the moments that you didn't share with the people who love you. Alcoholism oftentimes catches you late. Now, here's the deal. I have people in my center shoot heroin, smoke meth, smoke crack, you name it. I've had it all. The scariest thing for me to deal with, like, there's a couple of things that keep me up at night. And the scariest thing that I've ever seen and still see at my center is a 19-year-old kid, the first time I ever saw it. A 19-year-old kid who grew up in Palm Beach, who went to University of Colorado, who ended up at my center in a marijuana psychosis. A marijuana psychosis presents like a paranoid schizophrenic. It is the most frightening thing to witness. To see a young child, man, dabbing, smoking, and completely lose it. That, and when I have young adults come into my center that are addicted to Xanax, Those two things are the things that keep me up at night. Anybody else? Yes. Say that one more time, I'm sorry.
Right. How can you... You know, it, it breaks my heart, right? Like when I first started doing this, I would walk into gyms and I would do this and there was nothing there on the back end. So people would reach out to me with questions and want help, but I didn't really have anything to support them. But now with my foundation that this young man talked about, I have clinicians that will jump on calls, emails with you to talk you through some of the things you're going through. Unfortunately, in high school, middle school, kids have to go home. They have to walk into that. I think it's unbelievably important to grab a teacher, coach, counselor in this school to talk it through with. Because I can tell you, honest to God, I didn't find any peace or healing until I started talking. When I was no longer willing to keep the secrets, that's when things started to change for me. I spoke in Pennsylvania, and I know we gotta wrap this up, right? What, what time does this end? Okay, thank you. I spoke in Pennsylvania and it was for reason, like 15, windy, rainy, icy, and I'm in this old school auditorium, and I'm about 20 minutes into my talk, and this door opens in the back, but I don't see anyone. So I'm like, that's weird. Like, door opens and nobody comes in, but then all of a sudden, like 10 seconds later, I see this little head behind the seats and walking down the aisle. And as I look at this little boy who's like mm, nine, I realize he has no shoes on, he has socks. And I'm looking like, who's mom and dad? Who's he gonna go see right now? He doesn't go see anybody. He walks all the way down to me and sits right in front of me. And after I got done talking, this little boy, the principal walked up to him to help him. He had no shoes, it was 20 degrees, freezing rain. He said to me, I was at home and I saw that there was a guy speaking at the high school about drugs on the news. My mom and dad are at home doing drugs right now. Will you come home with me and talk to them? Nine years old, man. Willing to walk in his socks. To ask me to go to his house to talk about drugs to help his mom and dad. I grew up in alcoholism. My mom, my mom died when she was 50. My mom had my brother when she was 17, me when she was 21, she died at 50. My mom died from cancer. Sadly, one of the last conversations I had with my mother was her apologizing to me for keeping me in that alcoholic home so long and not get me out of it. My mom had to get that off her chest before she, before she died. This is about self-reflection. This is about the kids who hide their scars, who wear long sleeves. 
like today is a chance to roll up your sleeves. Today's a chance to like hug someone and say like, hey, I wanna do, I wanna do things different. Because honestly, the kids, and I'm gonna end it, the kids who can go out on Friday nights without it. The kids who can go to prom, dance, laugh, have fun, not need it. The kids who can walk into the gym and support the school and not have to be buzzed or under the influence. Like those kids are my heroes. And if you were sitting in the bleachers today or you were in that classroom and you are that kid, like I absolutely adore and look up to you. I could score a lot of points. I could put that little ball in that basket a bunch. I played in front of a lot of people. Two books written about me, a couple of documentaries. But when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, I couldn't even hang out with kids I've known since I was five without being high or drunk. Five years old, I knew those kids. And I still had to change myself. I want to thank you. I want to thank the school. I want to thank all the kids who raised their hand and had the courage to ask a question. I pray from the bottom of my heart that there's a kid in this gym right now that was impacted. So God bless all of you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart and have a great rest of the school year and be safe. Thank you. Chris, thanks.